Not Quite Cool is a podcast that contains spoilers, opinions, and general nonsense. Listener discretion is advised. I feel like every day the room that Chad records in starts to look more and more like an Indian woman's bedroom, right? <laughs> like, or like the back of an Indian gas station. Do you get that vibe at all? Oh, that was a second. Let me just ethernet in here. Yeah. Um, an Indian woman's bedroom. Bathroom. Yep, absolutely. Because he's got that, that curtain has a very specific region of India like feel. The, the color of the family portrait there, there's like one red, it looks like a chair that's arbitrarily thrown somewhere. Yeah, listen, that's that's the chair for the office okay. that I'm recording from, but it squeaks, so I don't sit in that chair while we're recording, but okay. that's what that chair is, so at least that part makes sense. Yeah, 100%, but, but do you at least see that you are becoming an Indian woman? I don't know. You know, if if this was recorded for YouTube for video, I would definitely change the background. <laughs> good, good. As long as we're all aware. But, you know, obviously, looking at Rob, he doesn't care the way he looks, so I don't care the way my room looks. Well, Rob has an excuse. Rob is finally about to be old enough to justify his appearance. Um, so we're waiting for this for God knows how long. Finally! Yeah. We welcome back to Not Quite Cool, ladies and gentlemen. This is a special episode. We are recording the eve of Robert Prago's birthday. Um, so I'm here with Chad. Chad, how are you feeling today? Doing good. And uh, Keith, in honor of you, I'm wearing a special shirt of one of your favorite movies. It is <laughs> Iceman from Top Gun. God. Oh, it would be better <laughs> if it was actually Iceman Bobby Drake. He looks like gl- uh, fucking Glacier from WCW. <laughs> <It's what laughs> Who does? Ray Lloyd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Val Kilmer, Kilmer on this shirt. Let's and then we are. Pan down. Pan down. Let's see the shirt. Doesn't he? It's kind of like bunched up. He looks too cognizant. There's too much actual light in his eyes for uh, for Luther said Lloyd. I don't know. He's kind of got like a Ron Perlman in Beauty and the Beast, like snaggly nose sort of situation. It, it's a little Dolph Lundgren to me yeah. in Rocky IV, maybe. I can see it. I can see it. Totally. Totally see that. Um, and then also here with us today, we have the birthday boy, Mr. Rob Prago, old enough that his social security number is four. Uh, how are you feeling today, Rob? Get off my lawn. Yeah, good. it's going to be a great show. It's going to be a great show. <laughs> hey, we're going to go ahead and dive into all of the wonderful things that we watched uh, over uh, the break in between episodes. And uh, the first one is the show that everybody's raving about, ranting about, talking about how glorious it is. And I'm sure that's exactly what we're going to do as well. Three episodes of the newest Star Wars installment that is Obi-Wan Kenobi, following the story of the mystic Jedi put a, who's become a by choice recluse uh, as he's drugged back in uh, to the adventure and to the fight. Chad, what did you think about these first three episodes of Obi-Wan Kenobi? You know, when it started off with that recap of the prequels, it really put me in the right frame of mind because it was just the good stuff from the prequels. Yeah, Like, I do like the prequels, but I don't love 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 the prequels yeah i loved everything they showed in the recap uh so i like that and i I feel like the show what the show is doing a little bit is it's getting rid of some of the stuff that i don't like from the prequels you know like i don't like there's bad dialogue in the prequels like really bad dialogue you know there's some bad cgi in the prequels and they don't have that so that that's good that they're that they're doing that and they're getting rid of some of the stuff I don't like from the prequels. Yeah. Did um, you not did you not like me in the prequels? Because they got rid of me too. Did you not like me? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just hadn't seen all the prequels. That's why uh, you don't like it, Rob. Yeah. But so so I think the show is ultimately fine. I I like this time frame, and I like Ewan McGregor as Obi Wan. I I'd watch him all day. Yes. I like a lot of that. I am, I had no idea that Leia was going to be in the show. No so that idea. That was a surprise. Yeah. And the fact that 
she's not just in the show. She's the show. Yeah, it it's about Obi Wan and Leia so far, at least the first three episodes. And I think she is great. I love that little little actress. I think she's very good. Um, so I like that. Some of the stuff that I don't like about it is I feel like that it's not that I'm a stickler for canon that much, but I feel like they're changing some stuff. And we could dig into it a little bit. There are changes of stuff from the original trilogy that I'm kind of like trying to wrap my head around that. And it's hard for me to separate that from my overall liking of the show. Yeah. No, I can totally get that. And I, and I guess we'll dive into that in a second. But before we do, let me warn our audience that one of the things that happens when you age is there's an orneriness, an anger that builds into things that are younger than you. As um, I approach my mortality. So that being said, <laughs> let me hand it over to the man who played Paul Retzka in the 1994 episode of The Godfather, uh, the 1994 episode entitled The Godfather of the TV series, Matt Locke, uh, Robert Pralgo. Uh, go ahead and tell us what you thought about Obi-Wan Kenobi. First, so when I have told people in the past that I was in The Godfather, it wasn't 100% a lie. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was sort of a, you know, a stretching of the truths. Um, look, who, the, who is this show for? Seriously. What, what, who, who the hell is this show for? It's, it's part puppet show. It's part Saturday morning kids show. The tone is all over the place. I don't know. I feel like the whole Star Wars universe is just the wild freaking West. And I'm starting to believe more and more that every expanded universe property where things are tied together really needs to have a show run. For the, not just for the show, but for the entire universe, because look, I, I feel like I'm rolling the dice when I when I when I look at the when I when I sit down to watch something. Is it going to be for a ten year old? Is it going to be for just Star Wars fans? Does it have broad appeal? Um, it is so all over the place. Look, Ewan McGregor is great. It, no, uh, Joel Edgerton. Give me give me just a a show of the two of them, you know, battling. Obviously, they're the breaking canon anyway. I don't just go ahead and do it. The little girl's great. Little, little girl is absolute. She's tremendous. Uh, I think the direction is awful, and I say that knowing I, Deborah Chow must be hamstrung over there because Deborah Chow is a great director. I saw her do great stuff with the good stuff with the Mandalorian. I mean, I've seen her do other stuff. She, this is such a. It, it's it's dark. It's edgy. It's it's buffoonishly cartoonish in its chase scenes. Um, it's poorly cast in its guest stars. It's it's all over the place. It doesn't make it, it's 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 a mess, dude. It is it is my least favorite Star Wars property that I've seen from beginning to end in its in its individual episodic wise. It is I think it's awful. I don't want to I don't even want to watch it anymore. I literally don't want to watch it anymore. It is awful. And Thank goodness I watched the first three episodes of The Boys season three today, which cleared out like all the shit, and I got to watch quality storytelling and next uh ladies and gentlemen rob Prago will explain why sex is overrated <laughs> it takes up so much time or so little time it takes up well, like anything that gets in the way of things i have to do as i approach my mortality come on i just i can't be spending six seven minutes on sex when i could be doing something else well love. let's be clear you probably couldn't spend six or seven minutes on sex. I think the I meant three episodes. I meant, three episodes. I, meant three. I meant coming back for more. <laughs> I think to me, uh I I love it. This is my favorite Star Wars show. Shut like, up, no kidding. That's shocking. I, I really, really dig it because I dig the fact that hey, you and McGregor, Jimmy Smith, this fucking little girl playing Layla. I think they're knocking it out of the park, each and every one of them. It's a master class in acting. I feel that I will 100% give you the chase scenes are laughable, but I didn't, when I was watching it, none of that, I, I didn't bump into any of that because I was sort of still caught up in the world of Star Wars because this to me feels like the Star Wars I imagined when I was a kid. Um, and I think it does a great job of, justifying some of the things that happened in the prequels and extending some of those emotional beats 
telling us what Obi-Wan's PTSD is. When did he find out Anakin was alive? We get to see that. We get to see, hopefully, the buildup that leads us to why that fight is so important in A New Hope. You know what I mean? Um, and, and I dig that. I dig the moments that it's happening. Uh, an asshole friend of mine the other day, I won't say his name, but he called me and he was bitching about the show and he's like, and the score is terrible. And I almost <laughs> drove to his ha- house to slap him <laughs> because it's John Williams and the beautiful themes that he's bringing. I'm sold. Like we're getting to places that I didn't think we were going to get to this soon. I knew we were going to get to Vader. I didn't think we were getting to Vader right off the fucking bat. Um, I, I, I just, you're right. I can't believe how anticlimactic it was. It was just amazingly. We're not talking about your sexual experiences anymore. We're on to Obi Wan. <laughs> enough about my sex life. More, yeah, about, yeah. <laughs> more about Darth Vader. Oh, but, Chad, since your opinion matters, uh, you, <laughs> you were talking about some issues you had with the canon. What are your issues? Yeah. So, and again, they, they could maybe explain this a little bit, but. You know, in episode four, New Hope, when they actually, Vader and Anakin meet to fight, you know, Vader's, uh, I'm sorry, Vader and Obi-Wan fight. Vader says, you know, when we last met, I was but the learner. Now I'm the master or something like that. Yeah. And I, and I feel like that's not what Vader feels like he is now. He, he's not a learner at this point. I mean, I, I feel like he feels like he's a master. This is, this is eight years or 10 years after episode three something like that because leia i don't know how old she is eight or ten so he's he's a master so i don't i don't really like that line but i also feel like leia's message in episode four you know help me up can only you're my only hope she says something like years ago you fought with my father in the clone wars I, i really feel like i'd be like you know like years ago when you saved me from being kidnapped like i feel like that's i wouldn't necessarily so i'm not saying that it's bad it's just like up here in the back of my head saying i I just feel like better writing maybe could have fixed some of these things a little bit that the vader and obi-wan if they're gonna fight they're gonna fight i get that so so that's why it's a little bit messing with the canon for me a little bit but i I want to touch on something you said too keith when you're talking about it's a show you know, when you were a kid that you'd want to see when they first announced that there was going to be a Star Wars TV show, like a long, long time ago, the first image was of the Mandalorian. This is what I envision, like a show where we get Obi-Wan, Darth Vader's in the show, a young Princess Leia. This is the Star Wars world that we are used to and we want to see more of. And I'm, I'm not bagging on Mandalorian. I think it's awesome. The Mandalorian is such a small pocket of that universe where they can play and do a lot of stuff. The problem is with Obi-Wan is you already have so many links that certain things that you do could mess up the canon. Mandalorian can do just about anything. Yeah, It doesn't mess up anything because he's not in anything else. So you have more freedom in those shows and potentially they could be better because of that. But, you know, again, I like the show. Uh, I'm enjoying it. I just have some reservations um I, I, mean, I was talking to rob and i said yeah i'm about to go watch episode three and he was like i hated it i almost left and turned it off i was like oh my gosh and i was watching the show just thinking like what is the point where it made him want to turn it off like, i know it was, right? it was like what was so egregious that you know was that way? That should be Rob's new name, General Egregious. That should be his <laughs> instead of guest teacher, General Egregious. <laughs> Hello there. Um, <laughs> That's a good impression. Let me, let me hop on something Chad said real fast. And this show, Obi Wan Kenobi. Was, I thought you were talking about the podcast. Go has ahead. been in has been in production and pre production pre production development for a long time, and has been. It was slated to start. It was stopped. The scripts were thrown out. It was re it was rewritten multiple times, um, restarted over and over again, just to make sure that they had the best scripts, that things were tight. Yes, you're right. Obi Wan has a lot of links, but that's why you need to have someone overseeing this. If you if you're going to try to deliver this shared universe, you better have somebody fucking with a big ass whiteboard tying things together and not pissing off. 
the fans and just just doing whatever the hell you want. I, I think that's very frustrating. And it's goddamn tone. You know, look, Marvel movies can be different, different genres and different tones, but it still sort of fits. There's still, there rarely has there been one where you went, well, that just completely went off the rails. Even the Eternals sort of looked like a Marvel movie, even though, eh, you know, what it was. Um, Why are we just shitting on random movies now? You know, yeah. And fuck Apocalypse Now. <laughs> wasn't half as good as the documentary. Screw it. Um, it, it, just, it. It just feels all over the damn place. I mean, it's... I think I, I, Star Wars as a whole feels all over the damn place, but I sort of feel like that's the mission. That's the job, is that each of these Star Wars shows are going to do, to me, the things that everyone criticizes the Marvel movies for not doing. The fact is that Marvel movies do sort of feel like they exist in a more homogenized world. Though I can point out the distinct flavors of each uh, film, the Star Wars shows feel like this one's a Western, this one's an anime, this one's a manga come to life. And then the Obi-Wan Kenobi story is like, did you forget this shit's about World War II? Because we're going to drive it home pretty hard for you now. We're going to make all the Nazi and Jew references. Here you go. And like, and I think to me, that's a smart move because it does take it back down to a more grounded place. This feels more dramatic to me than, than Mandalorian did or than, um, or than uh, Boba Fett did because it is dealing with that PTSD stuff. And I, I'll totally agree. There are definitely realms for criticism and critique of it. I think some of the writing and canon stuff could be easily fixed with the, the Grand Inquisitor. Maybe he didn't die. Maybe Grand Inquisitor is just a, um, a name that's given, you know, uh, and we find somebody who looks very similar. They actually bring Jason Isaac in and it was sort of, a, you know, a switch in Maru. Um, but even with that big fight that we know has to happen again between Obi-Wan and Darth Vader, even if Obi-Wan beats him and says your lesson Anakin is you had nothing to fight for then that justifies when we last but met I was a student like we have that 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 has a connectivity to it um but I think the problem with Star Wars is that something is always going to disappoint someone we look at the terrible death threats and hate mail that Moses Ingram has been receiving right there's always going to be a section of, of the audience that you can't appeal to because you're going to lose them no matter what you do. They're complaining about a character that had never existed prior to this thing. So, you know, I'm not saying Rob's on that level. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope not. Rob, Rob's not on that level. Um, that That's awful. But we did have a discussion about, um, obviously off the podcast, about just acting in general. And I felt like... <laughs> Moses Ingram, whose work I love. Yeah, me too. Um, on, I just forgot the name of the show. Good Lord, with uh, uh, Queen of My Heart. No, um, Queen, Queen, chess. Uh, Queen, Queen Gambit, Gambit, Queen Queen's Gambit. Yeah, um, tremendous work, and in the first two episodes, I felt was just. I mean, I felt everything she was doing was pushed and forced. I never felt any of her animosity or anger was anything other than just surface superficial levels and she was pushing. And even this third episode, when she winds, when she wanders into the, uh, where, where, the where they have the underground railroad of, where they took Leia through the back, um, when she wanders in there and she does this thing where she's mad and she, she throws the stuff off the table. And I was like- it That was a weak looks, moment. It just looked terrible, but that, it just, it just compiled on what she was doing. And I think what happens sometimes is you have a lunatic fringe out. Look at the world we live in, obviously. It's a lunatic fringe. And, you know, these internet cowards, when they, you know, if, if they do have an opinion on something, if they don't like the work, they will pile on and they'll blame it on race. And they'll blame, and they'll just be scumbags about it. Didn't that, well, the last Star the last two Star Wars movies, who is the, the, the Asian actress who got really just. Yeah. Marie I mean, Tran, Tran maybe? Yeah. Marie Tran. Yeah. Yeah. And, but also John Boyega, also yeah, uh, Donald I mean, so Glover. Like it's not a new thing. You have you have you have you have very mentally weak people who hold on to these things like a Star Wars, like this thing, like it's their security blanket. And if there's something they don't like or doesn't fit their, you know, the way they, they view the world, they attack. And they're pieces of shit. And, and, and you know, I don't know how you, you, you know, you 
you mitigate that the pieces of shit but you know it's it's unfortunate but i i think you know it has something to do with just again they don't like the show they don't like what's going on there so they place blame but i think it's like the this you know it, it roots to this this disconnection that we have with media to begin with where we love something so much that we assume it belongs to us and we have a headcanon version of it right and that headcanon version becomes its identity to us but also part of our identity i love batman the batman i love more than any other batman is the dark brooding loner batman and so when i relate to batman that's the one i relate to now me as an individual i'm accepting of any form of batman but take that same principle and apply it to people who aren't accepting in their day-to-day -day life they see star wars as a bunch of british motherfuckers and that's the movie they have so anytime they see something else that's star wars that's trying to be more progressive or just cast differently they put on their make space great again hats and then they sort of go into that tirade of the negativity and and whether it, it begins as an instinctual problem to, oh, or an instinctual rejection of someone's acting performance or the tone of the show it winds up being that their identity or their headcanon version of the fictional property has been pierced does that make sense at all um, absolutely also, I think Rob's frozen in a very uncompromising, uh, <laughs> flattering position. Yeah, if this was definitely be recorded, that'd be a good one. Yeah, that's a good still. <laughs> did I freeze or did you freeze? You froze, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I'm gonna screenshot that real quick, <laughs> so I don't lose that. <clears throat> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely Rob because I mean, I see you moving around just fine, Keith. Yeah, me too. So, <laughs> Rob, do you want to log off and log back in? He asked us again, Did I freeze or did you freeze? <laughs> you yeah. know, I don't know if you remember this, Keith. The last time Rob booted us was when you were uh talking about the Hollywood elites, yeah, and you got real political. <laughs> and the thing froze and he lost that podcast <laughs> completely and, now that we're yeah, a political nerve again yeah now you're getting a little political and he's like oh did i freeze sorry yeah and now he's gone and here i've got his entire imdb pulled up so i could just call him all the roles he's ever played yeah. gotta he's, fucking come back in yeah um, he, uh, he's afraid that you're gonna ruin his career by I'm, getting political this is, this is where i take him down a notch um <laughs> But while we're at it, let's talk about some other things that we watched. I think... Yeah, because he didn't see a lot of the other stuff, so it's fine if he doesn't show back up for a while. Uh, this next one, I, I didn't watch, but he, I think here he comes. Are you there with us? He's muted. Can you hear me? Yep, you're back. So much for the Ethernet making it better. God damn it. You just gotta get new internet, man. You know, it's funny that like the cord got cut outside my house a couple weeks ago and they came and just redid the cord. I don't know if they... You got to get that fiber. Uh, AT&T fiber. It's quite wonderful. Sponsor. Fiber, fiber for a lot of reasons. Shit. Um, gross. Uh, we're going to go on to our next movie, uh, which uh, Chad saw. I think Chad's the only one who saw it. Uh, shot in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it's a Netflix film um, starring Rebel Wilson. It's entitled Senior Year. Speaking of seniors, we got Rob on here. But Chad, uh, what did you think about Senior Year? So yeah, I've said this before on the podcast. I'm a sucker for high school comedies, uh, you know, and that that's what this is. It's Rebel Wilson. The gist of it is, is uh, she is not her, but the actress that plays Betty in the Spider-Man films. Yeah. Uh, is her in high school her, a senior and she's a cheerleader and she messes up a cheer and is in a coma for 20 years God. she wakes up as rebel wilson so <laughs> rebel wilson sees the world like it was 20 years ago so she just has wants to go back to school you know kind of happy gilmore or not happy gilmore uh, billy madison type thing where she's in school older than everybody else and you know, the comedy just comes from her being like a fish out of water. She, you know, nowadays, like in school, there's not necessarily like the popular kids are just the jocks. You know, there's like other people that are popular and she doesn't understand that. And it's just about her, you know, 
growing. So there's some funny stuff in it. It it's nothing to write home about at all. If you like high school comedies and you like Rebel Wilson, I'd say check it out. But otherwise, you know, it's 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 fine. It's just completely and utterly fine. I I like Rebel Wilson. I helped a girl uh, put on tape for this. I think one of Rob's friends or something. Amanda. Yep. And uh, um, and the script I saw was funny, but you know these things. It's comedy's hard. It's difficult. Um, There's some funny stuff in it for sure. Yeah, I mean some of the jokes don't land. Some does. I mean the premise is out there, but I mean like in a lot of these comedies, you know, you just have to uh, decide to go with it. Absolutely. So that didn't bother me. Yeah. Um, and sometimes things don't land, but the next uh, film that we're going to talk about seems like it's soaring. Um, I know Chad saw this because he cried. Rob might have seen it. I don't know. Uh, I cried because I haven't seen it yet. So. Okay, gotcha. So so only uh, Chad is the maverick here. And that's, of course, we're talking about Top Gun, uh, Top Gunnier, Maverick, Die Harder, whatever the fuck it's called. Top Gun 2, oh. more gun. Uh, Chad, how did you feel about this return to the way the world was 20 years ago, starring Tom Cruise and Mr. Fantastic? I, I love this movie. It was awesome. And uh, I legitimately did cry more than once watching this movie. It, it was awesome. Like, listen, I'm not breaking new ground here. Tom Cruise is a movie star. That oh, he is point. the movie star. That that's what he is. It's it, it's ridiculous, you know, how good he is or whatever. But you know, I'm not gonna spoil anything. You know, a lot of the stuff you saw in the trailer. But there's a scene, you know, like in the other Top Gun, the original Top Gun, when Maverick's flying and he's like, he says, "Talk to me, Goose," and he says this in the movie sometimes or whatever. But there's at one point where Miles Taylor's fine. He says, talk to me, dad. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's awesome. So it's definitely uh, a nostalgia for the original Top Gun. I think that it is better than the original Top Gun. Uh, I just recently rewatched the original Top Gun to get ready for this. So there's a lot of linkage and stuff like that. Uh, one of the scenes I cried in was the scene that had Val Kilmer in it. And it could be also not just the content of the scene, but Val Kilmer's real life. Yeah. situation and they did a really good job because in the movie uh they act like there's there's something wrong with Iceman and he is having trouble talking so they so they kind of play into it a little bit in the movie with his real life condition um but yeah it, for, talked about him, this movie is excellent I love it I, I, I cannot recommend it enough I know the Rob will see it. I know that Keith, for some odd reason, refuses to watch it. It's not just like, yeah, maybe I'll see it or maybe I won't. He is adamant. He has. This is the hill Keith wants to die on. He literally has drawn a line in the sand, will I, not do it, look, and threaten to fight me for it. He's like, I, if you yeah. will fight me. I don't stand racists. I don't stand misogynists. And I don't stand Top Gun. That's the three things I do. But I, I did see this interview or, or this article about Val Kilmer saying that his day on this shoot was the most authentic day of acting he's ever had in his life. That his interaction with Cruz was just all natural. Like, it, it was, and I felt it. I felt, like I said, it, it brought tears to my eyes. That scene, like I felt it. It was, it was excellent. I saw some behind the scenes stuff uh, and I started watching a little bit of uh, the documentary Val, the one with him shooting all the stuff. And I can't remember exactly where I saw this bit, but his voice is so damaged from the, the cancer treatment that he really can't speak. Yeah. He has to, he has to, there's a tube down there. So he doesn't sound like that, but his son, his eldest son sounds exactly like him. So the lines are a combination of what they've been able to pull from previous performances of his, and then mixed in with his son actually doing the lines. That's what we were able to create his voice. So it's interesting. But it, it, cool. it's, it's, it's insane the places that we find that sort of technology helping. Yeah. They also talked about that a little bit Um Doc Kilmer was in Kevin Smith's previous, his last movie, I guess, uh, Jay and Silent Bob reboot. And he plays like a version of like a Batman sort of character. And that same thing's incorporated there. But also in Obi-Wan Kenobi, it's not actually James Earl Jones doing the lines. It's a mixture of Hayden Christensen's and that software that recreated Mark Hamill's voice for The Mandalorian, which is not actually Hamill speaking. So it's kind of crazy that it's using all the old you know, vintage sound and running it through an AI system to create this new terrifying Skynet sort of world. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, Top Gun wasn't something I grew up with. Uh, maybe one day when I'm old, like you fucks, I might get into it. Um, but I, one thing I did grow up with 
Uh, let me tell you, uh, some crimes sometimes go slipping through the cracks, but these two gumshoes, they something else that rhymes with cracks. That's Ch- 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 Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers on Disney Plus, uh, starring the Lonely Island Boys. We have John Mulaney, we have Sandberg, we have fuck Will Arnett, J.K. Simmons. The list just goes on and on of some great, wonderful performances. I saw this. Chad saw this. Rob saw maybe five or six minutes of it. It was a a pretty good 15 minutes. Oh, shit. Damn. That's pretty impressive. Uh, So, Chad, what did you think about the probably most stunning film to come out all of 2022? (laughs) I thought it was very funny and very clever. Um, So I was not a Rescue Rangers fan growing up. I I was a little bit too old. So, but I was familiar with the Rescue Rangers. So I do feel like if I had watched the Rescue Rangers cartoon, it would have even been that much better yeah. because obviously they were referencing things from the cartoon that was over my head, but it didn't take away from the movie. It would only, I feel like, add that much more to it if you knew all that stuff. Yeah. So, it, so I, I think the writing was perfect in that regard because I didn't feel like I was out of the loop yeah. in anything. You know, they did a great job with that. And, you know, I'd said this when we watched the trailer. I'm hoping this is more Roger Rabbit than Space Jam. It absolutely was more Roger absolutely. Rabbit than Space Jam. The fact you he's know, in it, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, exactly. They they really use the properties in, like, cool ways. The biggest one, you know, which Rob even seen this, was Ugly Sonic at yeah, the beginning. Awesome. Unbelievable that Ugly Sonic was in this movie. The, the licensing Perfect. in this movie is just ridiculous. The characters that they got. Um, and we'll talk more about that. We're probably going to have to spoil some because uh, our next reviewer didn't watch the whole movie, which this is our pilot episode of our newest show, Kind of Reviewed, where Rob watches a couple of minutes and then tells us what he <laughs> thinks about this movie. Um, but yeah, so uh, going on to our next reviewer, uh, the man who played Robert Revs in the 1994 release of Stick Fighter. That's Rob Prago. Uh, Rob, what did you think about the first 15 minutes of Chippendale Rescue Rangers? I can't wait to get back to the next 15 minutes. You know, at this age, I can only watch in increments because I get winded watching movies. Um, yeah. It was a fun. You gotta go I, love, I, love, I, I have I've become a huge fan of Mulaney. I've always loved Sandberg. Um, just listening to them talk was cracking me up. And, and, and just back to Ugly Sonic. It's such a brilliant, God, just a brilliant maneuver. Just the self-deprecating going, yeah, okay, it's Ugly Sonic. We fucked it up. But yeah, okay, this is... This is what it is. Put it out there. And because they did it, it made Ugly Sonic valuable now. Where they can now, where now he's cool because he's self-aware and he is what he is. So he's not being forced on you. He's just mea culping. And and that makes him funny and it makes him accessible. And now if they do a Sonic 3, they should absolutely have Ugly Sonic show up in some type of multiverse alternate universe type thing and that would be amazing absolutely amazing um the i can't that, wait to watch more yeah the thing that impresses me is that they're not even the ones that fucked up sonic <laughs> disney like another studio did that and so disney's like not only are we going to make that character funny we're also going to shit on you for doing wow. it because all of our shit looks awesome like and then batman versus et and probably yeah. the most faithful depiction of Batman I've ever seen. And then just <laughs> turns and twists and cameos that every time someone new showed up, I was just like, how the fuck did they get that? How did they get Stan Marsh from South Park in this movie? Like, it yeah, was awesome. It was awesome. It was awesome. I, I had such a blast with such little expectations you know how pissed I'm going to be if Batman doesn't fight E.T. and Stan Marsh is not in this movie and I'm just being... I'm just, just holding strong. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. That's why you got to watch the movies to see if we're full of I'll watch the next video. This is our next podcast, Can We Fool Rob? When the <laughs> Golden Girls came back to life? What? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved it. And and something else that I'm really looking forward to, I haven't seen it. I don't think Chad's seen it. Uh, he just dropped today, um, and we both have things to do, unlike uh, the man who played the maitre D at the Valley Inn restaurant in 1995's All My Children TV series, Robert Prago. Um, that's The Boys Season 3. Now, apparently, new episodes are dropping 
once a week, which I think is yes, some- they drop the first challenge. three today, and then it'll be once a week. I, I don't know how many episodes this season has, but for the next okay. five six weeks, I'm guessing. But you saw the first three? I did. I had time today. <laughs> what were your thoughts? I, I loved it. I fucking loved it. I, I loved every second of it. Um, it's it's just so goddamn fun and unapologetic and honest and it's the acting's tremendous i love the writing it is fearless the effects look good it's funny you know in a strange way i I didn't make the i don't know if i made the connection back when we were all just enjoying peacemaker a a few months back but there's something it's not as good it's not quite as no fuck well maybe it is it's 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 sort of akin to peacemaker in a way where it just it the characters just don't give a shit they've got they're so barrel focused on their objectives and it's they they're not hindered by ratings and they just they're brutally honest and i just i I was belly laughing i was literally belly laughing pausing rewinding moments i thought i missed these characters and it's even what's great about the show even the most vile of characters the most disgusting are so well brought to life by these actors that still somehow get you to empathize with them a little bit and sympathize with them a little bit where it's just, it's one of my favorite shows on television. It's awesome. I, I would encourage you to watch it now. Thank yes, you. sir. Well, I think we got to finish this up first, but uh, yeah, we'll do. Um, yeah. I, I want to watch it. I'm, I'm eager to uh, a lot of Chad, you're not, in, you're not, you're, I mean, you, you haven't enjoyed it. You never got into it though. Right. I mean, I, I, I know I watched the first episode, maybe the first couple episodes trying to get into it. Didn't work. And the difference, again, I don't know how it goes, but the difference to me between that and Peacemaker was I like the Peacemaker characters. I, I like them a lot. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and they're doing vile things or they're killing, you know, they're, they're having that contest of who can kill the most people at that, that village or whatever, but I, but I, but I like them. They're, they're fun. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, at least the first episode when I watched it, again, season one, I, I felt gross after watching it. It was yeah. just, I, I was not enjoying it at all. So I didn't watch it. And These are unlike much, yeah, it's, it's, a dark, it's a darker, it's a darker, bleaker feel. I didn't, there's nothing bleak about Peacemaker to me. I didn't feel bleak. It was just, right. it, 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 was, it, it was more fun. It, it certainly was, a, yeah, I, I, see, I see that. And I, and I think, you know, one of the reasons why you like it is because unlike Obi-Wan, this, the show is obviously not for 10 year olds. So that's why probably you're a, you're a big fan. That's what I said. But I also feel like yeah. you hit it right on the head when you said gross. Like I feel, cause I watched the animated series of the boys and it's gross, but I, I liked it cause I like gross shit. Clearly look at me, but I, it does have this like level of, you know, like in the Rin and Stimpy cartoons when it would do close-ups of things and they'd be like, I gook, that's the boys. Yeah. It's, that's the world. And I'm cool with that, but I could recognize why, you know, some people wouldn't be. Um, but anyway, let's move on to the next film, uh, which is another film that some people are going to be cool with and some aren't. Uh, really, I'm shocked that Rob hasn't seen this one because it seems like it's uh, something of a lot of interest to him. And that's uh, the new film, Men. Um, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I got. I got to check with the judges. Yeah. They got a fifty dollars fine. I think it's so smart that no fine on that one person. <laughs> um, but uh, the Alex Garland's new A twenty four release uh, of Men is wow. Uh, we did the trailer, I think, on one of these episodes. Uh, maybe I don't know. Chad looks like he's confused. The story, I mean, I saw I remember, the trailer. I don't remember talking about it, but I don't know. Probably not. Um. The film, the story is this girl's husband kills himself to sort of, you know, recoup her mind and and to find solace. She takes a vacation from London into the country, northern countryside of England, where she starts to notice that all the inhabitants of the town are male and they all look the same. And then violent, strange things start happening. And the movie is very much an allegorical film. Um, Alex Garland's previous work includes uh, Ex Machina and um, uh, fuck, with the Natalie Portman movie, Annihilation, uh, which both deal in the sci-fi sort of world, but they're very much strange. Boring. 
God damn. Uh, they're very much straightforward. This is not straightforward in any capacity. And it is, I, I think, ultimately a metaphor for the cycle of abuse more than anything else. Uh, a lot of people are going to watch this and think, well, this is man-hating. No, it's, it's about relationships between men and women, but a specific type of relationship and how we have to break that. And it's interesting. It is graphic as fuck. There is a 15-minute sequence of men giving birth to other men through their rectums. And uh, yeah. And so I finished watching the movie and I'm starting to walk out of the theater and I see this couple, like they had to be teenagers sitting in the front row. And the girl turns to the guy and says, I told you we should have watched Top Gun. And that was the fun. That's the perfect, you know, encapsulation of it. I liked men. You're not going to in the, the, the end. So, well, you know, I wonder if uh, you're actually in the theater with my daughter because her and her boyfriend went. Oh really? Yeah, I'm so far away from you though. I know. I, I, I know, but she was. Uh, I think I, I feel like she's going to be so mad at me because I can't remember what she said about it. But I know that she was talking about that sequence that you're talking about, and she was like, "That was just ridiculous. It totally lost me." Yeah, because you know, it I was mean, like, I, "What?" I get the purpose of it because it is this uh, like perpetuating like uh, the, we keep breeding the same problems until somebody puts an end to it, um, and that's sort of the idea there. But where the rest of the movie still plays allegorical, it doesn't pull out the metaphors until the very end. And I feel if they would have woven more of the metaphor in throughout, then you would have had a stronger. It's a weird fucking movie. It's, it's whatever. Um, but let's talk about, uh, you know, there are Stranger Things out there. And so let's talk about some of them. Season four of Stranger Things, uh, the first half of it just dropped on Netflix. Um Chad watched it. I refuse to watch it because I feel the casting has gone downhill ever since season two. Uh, uh, so, Chad, what did you think about Stranger Things season four? Listen, I know the real reason you can't talk about it is because you signed an NDA. <laughs> you know, <laughs> convenience store clerk is coming back yeah. in the second half of season four. I got it. It's okay. We can cut this out if I'm not allowed to talk about it, Keith. It's fine. But uh, I'm a huge fan of Stranger Things. Like, I love every season. I love all the characters. They are awesome. Uh, this season is much darker than the others. Now, they've been it's been dark before, but this season is really dark. I mean, we are seeing, you know, high schoolers maimed and murdered uh, very violently, you know, and it, it, the graphics, it looks awesome. I mean, it's like a supernatural thing that's happening to them, yeah. but it looks incredible. And, you know, uh, unlike maybe some of the other seasons, this season does feel like that anybody could die. Now, I'm not saying someone will die at the end of this, like somebody important, but I wouldn't be shocked if a main cast member dies before it's over. You know, maybe in a convenience store or something like that. I don't oh, know. Who knows? But, you know, we'll see what happens. But, you know, the, the I, I like this season a lot. It's not my favorite. The reason why it's not my favorite, at least so far, is I'm a big fan on ensemble shows when everyone is together doing things. Like, I love the interaction. And this season, far more than the other seasons, has a lot of them separated doing different things. These two characters are off on the side quest. These three characters are in California doing something. Eleven's off doing this by herself. These four are doing this which I'd like the dynamics of those people, but I want them all to come together and they haven't yet. Gotcha. So, so I like it when they're all together more. So that's my issue with the season, but that's just more personal thing. But the season is certainly well done. It's excellent. Episode four and episode seven are the, the two best so far. And they're great. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to uh, part two, which comes out uh, in July. How many episodes were in this first section? It was seven episodes. However, every episode was like an hour and 20 minutes. They were all mini movies, just about. It was crazy how big these episodes were. And part two is only two episodes, but it's one is like an hour and 45 and two hours and 40 minutes. So they're just movies. That's all it is. And then so it's these next two episodes in July and then one more season and then they're done. As far as I know, but I have heard that they have ideas, plans for spinoffs. And I feel like depending on what the numbers are, you know how that goes. 
Netflix will be like, yeah, make some spinoffs. Yeah. But as far as I know, season five would be it for the main show properties. Yeah. But who knows? I mean, some of these shows go on forever, especially with all the different streaming platforms. And that brings me up to uh, the last review we're going to be talking about before we go into trailers. It's something I watched um, yesterday, uh, brand new on Paramount Plus, And that is uh, South Park, the streaming wars, which Ooh. is uh, another one of Trey Parker and Matt Stone's. We made billions of dollars off of our deal uh, movies. And it's fucking brilliant. Um The basic plot of South Park Streaming Wars, I'm going to say the title one more time, South Park Streaming Wars, is that there is a water shortage supply, so different farms are trying to see if their streams make it to the reservoir, so they (laughs) create streaming services that people can subscribe to to get extra water. Now, all of this serves as a satirical background for them to talk about their deal and how many people are pissed off with them about making this deal and all this money. And then in the end, Cartman gets fake breasts. So it's like a weird journey that we take that is absolutely fucking amazing. Uh, it, it's the first part of a multiple installment uh, it has a lot of Chinatown story elements in it. And if you're a South Park fan, you know, which has been going on for 28 years or what the fuck ever, you should go check this out. It's it's phenomenal. Um, but yeah, that, that's all of our movies. Now we're going to get into everybody's favorite area. Oh, which- before I jump on, I did watch the first episode of uh, Star Trek uh, Strange New Worlds. We got- I jumped up. I jumped on it last night. I, it was a last second thing. It was very I good. I talked to you on the phone today. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, before we go boldly into trailers, <laughs> let's let the guy who played Eddie on Baywatch Nights in 1996, I threw up in my mouth a little bit saying that, uh, talk about Star Trek Brave New World. Wait, wait, before you talk, Rob, Keith messed up. He should have said the guy who played Robert Archer in Star Trek First Frontier. Hold on, Chad messed up because it's Robert April. Robert <laughs> April. Archer was Archer uh, is Enterprise. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's Enterprise. And, and I'm just so bad that I messed that up. I'm just oh. thankful those are some of the things you pulled from because there's so many worse. Um, oh, I'm gonna go through. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what he said when you were off the podcast for those two minutes, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> just went down the worst. Um, I, I just. It was great. It was, it was very enjoyable. Um, thanks. Moving on. That's what it, you it made felt, me. No, it felt, it felt like, look, I, there's no, there's no secret. I didn't like discovery. I had a tough time getting into it. Um, this really, this first pilot episode. And again, there's a, there's a familiarity with Captain Pike going back to the original episodes and stuff. So there is something there. And Anson Mount is, he's, he's solid. He's, he really is solid. This thing is well cast. There's some actors in this, in the show that I absolutely love. Um, and it felt like old school, nice, tight episode. And uh, this, this episode dealt with first contact. They put a spin on the opening. The opening scene about first contact was just a great perspective the way they did it. And it was just a really well done first episode. Uh, it didn't necessarily uh, initiate any type of overarching storyline, but it brought all these characters together. And uh, really set a good tone, and I'm looking forward to the next episode. That's all I'm saying. Um, this actually felt like Star Trek to me, so there you go. That's awesome. There you I, go. you know, I hear a lot of awesome things about it. It's supposed to be more of a monster of the week sort of uh, show, and that sounds fun. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I love the fact that Black Bolt is playing uh, uh, Pike. Pike. I also think it's weird to me how many people are coming out of the woodwork and they're like, oh, finally, Pike, the captain we all relate to. He's such a good character. And I'm like, you've only seen this motherfucker twice. Yeah, and he's exactly. only played by the same guy once. And and half the second episode, he's in a fucking box. Like, yeah, <sighs> not moving at all. I, yeah. I know. And so with a tragic, awesome story, but let's not act like he's a fan favorite. You know what I mean? He's a Roomba is what he is. He's no Robert April. No, clearly. Or Robert Archer. <laughs> or Eddie from Baywatch Nights, 1997. Right. Starring uh, the great and unappreciated Yasmin Bleeth. I fucking love Yasmin Bleeth. Talk about basketball. You? Oh, my God. The South Park guys. Yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, now we're going to move on to trailers. Play that awesome song. Cool.
Um, now that we've played the awesome song, let's go ahead and dive into a movie that basically gives you the answer about what happens when you wish upon a star. And clearly, we're talking about Disney's Pinocchio, uh, directed by Robert Zemeckis for Disney Plus, starring Tom Hanks, Lorraine Bracco, Joseph Gordon Levitt, Luke Evans, Keegan Michael Key, Cynthia Erivo, Sheila Adam, Benjamin Evan Ainsworth, Lou and Lloyd, Hannah Flem, uh, let's see, Giuseppe Bazzian, Aiden Towers, a- Amy Lee Ronaldson, and Latoya Harding. This story looks classical i mean uh robert zemeckis you know he's doing a live action adaptation of disney's pinocchio it just looks uh, marvelous to me chad what did you think about the trailer the teaser really for pinocchio you know i've been vocal on this podcast that i'm not a fan of the live action remakes like i did like cruella but that's not a remake of 101 i don't i don't like the live action remakes and this seems like more of the same Wh- whatever like no. this was nothing whatever it, they're not cartoons anymore we're seeing the same thing i mean some of them are cartoons still but that's fine. And then we don't even see pinocchio whatever like this is more of the same i'm not a fan of the live action remakes it's not the way it was when he was a kid in the 40s grumble grumble <laughs> grumble well let's get the perspective of the man who played the beat poetry mc in the 1996 release of beat daddies <laughs> robert Brago. what did you think I'll agree with Chad in the sense that it doesn't really give you a lot. There's no, you're not getting anything. I, I, it was nice to see Jiminy Cricket in sort of cartoon form. That was whatever that was, 3D yeah. CG uh, form. And uh, it was fun to hear that song again. I mean, it sort of brought back memories. It just, um, I, I, I gotta, I sort of need, I need Tom Hanks' voice sounding like Tom Hanks. We're coming off a really weird thing he did in that Elvis trailer, which is like, what the fuck is that? And then, He's doing this other thing now, and I'm like, "What oh. if that's just his career from now on?" He's like, "I've done all the serious acting from oh. now on. I voices like that's all he does." <laughs> yeah, I was kind of like, "Oh my god!" But you know, I'm hoping Zemeckis. Look, Zemeckis is a is a great director. I mean, he has done legendary stuff. I'd like to see a return to form. That would be awesome. You know, in a way. Um, mm. I love the cast. Sounds like a lot of fun. I'm a big fan of Joseph Gordon Levitt and the gang and. And Cynthia Revo, and I think these are all great people. Um, yeah. you know, look, it's gonna. Did I say? I think it's going straight to Disney Plus, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. Um, I was about to say something about box office, but you know, it's you never know box office. But yeah. um, it, I mean, it looks pretty. I, will I watch it? You know, I I, I want to say yes, but I still haven't seen Beauty and the Beast. So I haven't seen I haven't seen the re- I haven't seen Lion King, the 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 live action version. So. I haven't seen the live action version of of, uh, of uh, Dumbo, and that is that is littered with people I love in that movie, yeah. and I just haven't done it, and so I don't honestly I can't honestly say that I'm even going to sit down and take the time to watch this. I'd like to think I would and catch up, but I don't know. I hope it's great for everybody who watches and is a fan. Well, of if it's anything like the Robert Zemeckis, Tom Hanks, Polar Express, it'll be another clunker. But at the same time, that movie. So let's look at the Robert Zemeckis, Tom Hanks combos, Polar Express and Forrest Gump, right? So even when Zemeckis is dabbling in animation, he still makes movies that change the way animation functions forever on after uh, and is an innovator in the technology. I haven't seen the, I haven't seen, I guess, Welcome to Morrowind or Allied. Um, I think are the only two Zemeckis I haven't seen. So but Back to the Future, Cast Away, the other Zemeckis, Tom Hanks. Like, the man has as good of a track record almost as James Cameron, who I think has the best track record in, in film history. Um, and so I'm, I'm here for it. Uh, Pinocchio is not my favorite animated film ever, um, but it has some dark, interesting, compelling things and an amazing study of animation to itself so i i'm excited to see what they do plus i already, i'm already subscribed to disney plus so i don't know um i'm probably in sort of a gray area about it maybe but that leads me to our next film directed by the russo brothers it's called the gray man when the cia's most skilled operative whose true identity is known to none accidentally uncovers dark agency secrets a psychopathic former colleague puts a bounty on his head setting off a global manhunt by international assassins starring on a 
Armas, Ryan Gosling, Chris Evans, Jessica Hinwick, Roger Jean Page, Wagner Mara, Billy Bob Thornton, Julia Butters, Alfrey Woodard, Danush, Callan Mulvey, Karen Jim Beck, Scott Hayes, Robert Kaczynski, uh, Ashwara Sanar, Dioba Operai, Ime Ilkawar, and Jimmy Jean Louis. Um, this is The Gray Man. Chad, what did you think about the trailer for Netflix's new action packed film? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You know, Ryan Gosling versus Chris Evans looks yeah. looks great. Looks action packed. Put Anna Donis in everything. I'm I'm all for that. You know, I love her. This is probably a first day watch for me on Netflix. Um, the question I have for you though, Rob, is because you've been pretty vocal about Netflix movies not looking for the most part like big budget. I'd see it on the big screen. I feel like this one looks like a big screen film. Yep. It seems like it's got the budget. Absolutely. And it is premiering in theaters for a 14 day run as well as doing the Netflix drop. Um, but, but since Chad's taken it over and, and sent the question to the man who played uh, Gus Perello in the waterfront, though he was credited as Robert Pralzo. I don't know. That's weird. Uh, <laughs> uh, in oh, what was that called? What project was that? The waterfront in 1998. Um, uh, this such is, a paycheck guy. That's absolutely right. it just works for a director of this film's heart is broken. Yeah, that, that did did my, you really that like think, my ski lodge in Colorado? I'm pretty sure the waterfront. That, yeah, that's exactly what it did. Did you like really try to emulate that character in that one? You don't even remember who he is. Just it was just so he could say he was in the waterfront and people would be like, on the waterfront? You were in that? And like, in the waterfront. This is how I try to attach myself to Brando. I have the Godfather Matlock and I have the waterfront. Yeah. Missing. Yes, thank you. So, uh, but Rob, what did you think about the trailer for The Gray Man? You Gray Man? I should have said that. That was fucking right there. Oh, see, there you go. That's, you missed out. I look, it looked really good to me. I was, again, after, after coming off the disappointment of that rock movie on Netflix. Red Notice. That looked like it was just on... You know the back one of the, one of the stages here in Atlanta just looked ugh. red. Notice I don't know where the money went. This looked great. It looked it looked epic. It looked it looked like they traveled the world. Um, and I found both actors looked like they were really really tapping into some fun fun chemistry. Um, I love the tone of it. Uh, big fan of the Russo brothers. I, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to this. This looks like a lot of fun. It looks like a again. It looks like a big time movie. Yeah. Um, that should be in the theaters, and will I see it in the theaters? I don't know. You know, I may wait for Netflix, but it's, hey, there's a chance I can see it in the theaters. But it yeah. still should be there. <laughs> That's right, by God. Um, uh, I thought it looked. I don't look like a lot of fun. I don't look like a lot of fun. And like you said, Anna Darmus, holy crap, put her in anything. I, what, what's taking so long to announce the spinoff of her character from the last Bond movie? That's what I'm saying. Holy shit! Probably the issues of the director. Probably. What's that? I said probably the issues with the director of the last Bond movie. But I also feel like she was in a Marilyn Monroe biopic that was shot like three years ago that still hasn't come out yet. Yeah, that's coming out too. Yeah. NC-17 rating uh, for Blonde. Nice. Yeah, but like this movie is... (laughs) That was recorded. I'll go ahead and take that out. He's like, nice. I didn't know about that. That's awesome. NC-17. Uh, Ten-year-olds can't even watch this. They'd have to say wow. it. God. <laughs> I only like my cartoons kissing. Anyway, um, so this is... Uh, I, I mean, NC, I like this NC-55. Yeah. I think Chris Evans is underrated for the character performances he does. I think he does some really great work. Yep. I think Ryan Gosling is just naturally funny as fuck. He, sure. And he's just so charismatic and a good actor. And the Russo brothers... I loved everything I've seen of theirs, whether it's, you know, their Marvel work or fucking community or Arrested Development or Cherry. I fucking adored Cherry as a film The even everything everywhere all at once, even though they've just produced it fucking phenomenal. So, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm totally going to watch it. I think by law, I have to. Then if I have any difficulty with those laws, I know who to call thanks to their new Disney Plus television series, She-Hulk Attorney at Law. Jennifer Walters navigates the complicated life of a single 30-something attorney who also happens to be a green foot, a green six foot seven inch superpowered Hulk. This Disney Plus television series stars Tatiana Maslani, Jamil uh, Jamil, Mark Ruffalo, Tim Roth, Ginger Gonzaga, Josh Segara, Griffin, 
Yes, yes, Steve Golder, yeah. Griffin Matthews, Benedict Wong, Renee Elise Goldsberry, John Bass, Nicholas Cirillo, um, Michelle Curiel. I'm going through to see if I know anybody's names. I don't. I think that's all I got. Robert Tinsley. Um, so a bunch of interesting people. Uh, this is a Netflix, I mean, not Netflix, Disney Plus series that we finally got a trailer for. There's probably going to be a couple of discussions about this, but let's go ahead and go with Chad. What did you think about it? I'm going to take the CGI of her face and put that to the side for a minute. Yes. Other than that, uh, this trailer looked fun. Uh, it's cool that Tim Roth is back. Um, in the comics, Keith, I'm a fan of the sensational She-Hulk, yeah. Savage She-Hulk, whatever. So this is more of the sensational She-Hulk side, which is the type of She-Hulk I like. You know, it it's fun. This doesn't seem like there's any type of end of the world type stuff in this one, you know. Um, so I'm looking forward to this one. I am wondering, Keith, if you are willing to lay down that Daredevil will also not be in this show, that he's not going to show up. Because if he's going to show up in a Marvel show that's not his own, it's going to be a miss. And it's turning right? it off. But then the problem is like, just from a logical standpoint, I don't know that he's passed the bar in California. He's only I was say, why is he going to be in LA? I thought I thought the same thing. I thought he was clearly going to be in the show, and then I found out it was in LA, and I was like, well, what the fuck's he doing in LA? But there's always the case that something happens. Maybe like one of the criminals from Hawkeye is on trial, and she probably has jurisdiction because she works for the government, so she can represent anywhere. So she comes to New York for the trial of Kazi, the clown from Hawkeye. Uh, and then that introduces us to Murdoch or something like that. You know what I mean? Or they don't care. And yeah, Daredevil's well, just there as a warrior. It is about a radioactive woman. Because yeah. I, mean, I feel like you guys are like, there's no possible way that Daredevil <laughs> could ever practice law in California, First guys. All, this Robert is unbelievable. Really no way I'm possible. Stop messing I with don't understand. Disbelief. <laughs> but that's... <laughs> so... The insults of us aside, man who played Vance Clarington in the television series Going to California in 2001. Gap in your career there, buddy. Um, what did you think about the uh, trailer? I was just pre preparing to meet Jenny McCarthy is what I was doing as Vance Clarington in Going to California, who was married to the director of that episode at the time. She was so freaking cool. Jenny McCarthy, I will, I'll go to my grave. One of the coolest people I've ever met. Don't um, listen to medical advice, though. That's, that's Yes, exactly. Yes. Um. What was the question? <laughs> I was thinking about the Jenny McCarthy. Trailer. Yeah, I was setting aside the uh, the special effects. And look, I, that's just one of those things I, going back and looking at it after hearing everybody bitch about it, I go, oh yeah, very uncanny valley. But when I first watched the trailer, it didn't bother me in the least. And I think that goes to the to the storytelling. It goes towards the acting. It, I, I really like the trailer. I love the fact that the trailer opens up deceivingly dark Ruffalo going, you know, it's, you know, the life of a superhero isn't what all it's cracked up to be. And you see a couple of crews in the dark. It looks very violent. You see a car wreck and then it sort of morphs into Ali McBeal, um, which is not a shot for me. I loved Ali McBeal. I thought it was great. I hope this show is weekly. They're able to utilize B level or, you know, even sometimes a level characters that she's dealing with on cases week to week to week. And it doesn't need to be this, again, overarching, you know, and I'm sure there will be an overarching through line, but from week to week that we get samples of different, different superheroes or people involved in different movies that we've seen or shows that just that she's working on as part of this organization that Steve Coulter is heading up. Mm -hmm. And um, it looks good. It looks like a lot of fun. I can't wait for it. Yes. Going back, I do hope they they tweak the effects a little bit. They, they, they fix that up, but I'm, I'm sure they will. But the thing <laughs> that, that bothers Don't worry, Rob, I know somebody yeah. that's yeah. going to be fine. <laughs> I, but, well, I, reportedly they've already fixed most of it, but anyway, the thing that bothers me about what you just said uh, was that you're like, it didn't really bother me. Her face at points was detached from her body, but you had an issue with the chase scene in Obi-Wan Kenobi. But this girl's not having a face. No, I didn't run into that. That was fine for me. I just, I don't, I don't get you. I don't get you. It's all well, this wasn't the show. This was a trailer. 
and I'm assuming it's going to be fixed. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what you were doing when you were watching. I'm going to tell you exactly what was happening. You were watching it on your phone while you were taking an old man shit, and you were like wincing when the face was on. You didn't even notice it. There, the end. You have you, your standards are not the same ever. That's that's the point I'm making here. There's no way while they were screening Star Wars Obi Wan Kenobi Episode One that they're watching these three numbnuts chase this girl. She ducks down under the branch, and this moron runs square into the branch as they're looking at the branch. And how the hell did that pass? It's whimsical. Anybody's muscle. That's all it is. That's all it is. What is it? I lost. I was screaming when you said that. Yeah, that's fine. I, I'm excited about the show because Leapfrog uh, seems to be in it. Uh, Dante Ha is in there. Um, at the beginning, Dante's a, a friend of, I would say the podcast, but just me, really. Um, and <laughs> they look like the Wrecking Crew, which has got me fucking excited. And I that's think cool. this gives us a, like a chance to see some of the characters that probably would never make it into a feature film. You know what I mean? Some of the, the low level, like if Kangaroo shows up, the bad guy, that's fucking great. Yes, there is a DC, I mean, a Marvel villain named Kangaroo. So like a lot of interesting characters can be there. And again, I give me all the different tones. Show me that the MCU world is just as complicated and complex as our world. Um, all these stories have a place. And, and plus I get to see superheroes and she's hot. The end. But I, I'd like to I'd like to uh, ask for a Marvel team up with Kang and Kang Aru. No. Anybody? Moving on. Um. So, like the planet Alderaan, let's blow that shit up and move on to our next series. You are uh, welcome. A new Star Wars show called Andor, only for Disney Plus. A prequel series to Star Wars is Rogue One in an era filled with danger, deception, and intrigue. Cassian will embark on the path that is destined to turn him into a rebel hero. Starring Diego Luna, uh, Alex Ferns, Anton Valenci, Adria Arjana, Genevieve O'Reilly, Stellan Skarsgård, Denise Gao, Fiona Shaw, Kyle Soller, Alex Lothar, Harry Anton, and Robert Imms. Uh, obviously a prequel to Rogue One, which I thought was a fantastic, fantastic movie. Um, this series seems to be about espionage, darker tone, uh, showing, I, I don't know, the oppression that people are under, under the thumb of the Empire. Uh, Chad, what did you think about the, the preview for Andor? Yeah, I'm a big fan of Rogue One as well. Um, and this was dark. It, you know, it had Rogue One vibes in that regard. You know, Rogue One is probably the darkest Star Wars movie. It's a war movie, you know, hardcore. Yeah. Um, so I really like, I, I don't, we've seen a lot of it with the Rebels cartoon and now with Obi-Wan. But for some reason, I just feel like we just haven't explored this time frame a lot between three and four, episode three and four. The, like the birth, the true birth of the rebellion and things like that. So I'm very interested in the show and, you know, I hope we see some of that. You know, I hope we see more of the Empire getting even powerful and, you know, rebels, you know, becoming rebels. So, yeah, I'm, I'm here for this, of course. Absolutely. And uh, what about the man who played Paul Truly in the 2002 uh, short Epiphany? Um, Robert Prago, what did you think, sir? I remember that. Good Lord, I'm so old. Um, in, the, uh, in the vast universe of Star Wars, I think I've liked four things. And Rogue One is... High at the top of my list. I loved Rogue One. I absolutely loved Rogue One. And um, I love the feel, the vibe, the, the story, everything. Uh, I look forward to going back and uh, revisiting with these uh, characters whose fate is sealed. Um, I, and I love the trailer. I got, I got right back in it. And um, got, look, I thought the trailers for Obi-Wan Kenobi look good too. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna throw all my chips in here, but um, I, I'm looking forward to it. I, I I'm looking forward to revisiting with all these characters. I'm excited that Tony Gilroy uh, is 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 one of the people overseeing it. I don't know yeah. if he's actually showrunner necessarily, but he might be. Um, um, but he was heavily involved with uh, Rogue One as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And um, I look forward to this. This looks really good. This will be a nice sorbet to clear the palate of the crap we're watching now. You talking about the podcast? No, I understand. I definitely need sorbet after this. But I feel that... 
Andor is going to be, again, furthering and expanding that universe and telling us that a lot of different types of stories are possible. And along with the preview for this, we obviously got news and confirmation of Skeleton Crew, uh, the new show uh, starring Jude Law, created by John Watts, um, Tales of the Jedi, um, a new animated series that follows Ahsoka Tano and uh, Count Dooku, which is going to be interesting. Um, and then we got a bunch of confirmation about different uh, characters who will be appearing in Ahsoka. Chad texted me very excitedly uh, about Chopper and, and Hera and Sabine being in it. And I got equally excited and I told Rob and Rob's like, oh, why are you here? Um, so that was interesting. But yeah, um, I didn't text Rob that. Yeah. That soup is called. <laughs> yeah. But Andor, yeah, I'm stoked about it. I think it's, you know, and it's very similar to in a way, Star Trek Brave New World, where Rob eloquently put it, we know the capping. We know the destiny of these characters. And so we're just trying to figure out how we get there. You know what I mean? Um, and to quote George Lucas, it's like it rhymes. You know what I mean? Um, because the same thing happens with Anakin in the prequels. We know where they wind up. George Lucas is a lot like Kermit the Frog. There's a lot. It's, George it's Lucas, a lot. Is, Lucas is a lot like Kermit the Frog. Yeah, it's so, yeah, um, uh, but I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm trembling uh, with anticipation for that film and for this next one. And that is uh, a new installment in the MCU. I think it's our next film up of the MCU. I think actually Rob's still outside of the theater waiting for it. That's Thor Love and Thunder, directed by Taika Waititi. Thor enlists the help of Valkyrie, Korg, and ex-girlfriend Jane Foster to fight Gore the God Butcher, who intends to make the gods Extinct, starring Christian Bale, Taika Waititi, Natalie Portman, Palm Clementef, I can't say her name right, the lady who plays Mantis, Karen Gillan, Chris Pratt, Chris Hemsworth, Russell Crowe, Sam Neill, Tessa Thompson, Matt Damon, Jamie Alexander, Vin Diesel, Bradley Cooper, Melissa McCarthy, Dave Bautista, Luke Hemsworth, and Sean Gunn. Jesus Christ, what a beautiful, zany cast that's going to be. Chad, what did you think about the trailer? The first trailer to show us gore the god butcher for the film thor love and thunder yeah you know we've already talked about the teaser on the show yeah and this is similar to the teaser there's some amazing shots it looks funny but obviously the difference between the teaser and this one the main event is we see christian bale as gore the god butcher and you know christian bale is an amazing actor there's there's no doubt he's one of the top tier actors being gore the god butcher i'm very excited yeah. to see what he does with this. Um, I think he looks cool. I do wish maybe he had a little some tendrils like God Gore the God Butcher because you could still see his face. It wouldn't affect anything with what he's doing if you give him the tendrils. Maybe he gets them later. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but overall, yeah, th this is hopefully it's going to be awesome. It looks like it's going to be awesome. But yeah, Christian Bale, heck yeah. yeah. Um, so moving on to uh, the man who played Jack Hess in the 2002 release Bloodbath, which IMDb notes is a video. I don't know what that means. Um, uh, Robert Prago, what did you think about the trailer? And never released because uh, the brain trust behind it um, was, was so convinced that sound was okay the way they had it set up. Okay. Didn't tell anybody that the sound wasn't being handled professionally. That's why it's exclusively video. Yeah, and uh, anyway, and uh, you probably be familiar with some of the brain trust. No problem. But let's not uh, get into that now because my fucking head will explode. Um, you know, this is one of those things where I look at this and I go, "How do I? How do I keep my composure? How do I keep my expectations at a reasonable level?" Because it's like you've just laid out all the great, all these things that I love, and topped it off with Christian Bale, who I would argue is might be our finest working actor today and you know and he raises up every everybody around him in this movie is a-list arguably and he's gonna raise them up uh handled by one of my favorite directors right now and i love this storytelling in taika waititi i'm sitting here going i can i i can only be disappointed in this movie right i'm trying to, can this movie actually live up to what what i'm where I'm, I'm really trying to temper my expectations and and i think in a way the trailer, I enjoyed the trailer, but even then I was like, I wanted, you know, that first trailer from Ragnarok was just, you know, transcendent. It was like, what the fuck is this? And um, this is going to be a lot of fun. I, I, um, I, I'm looking forward to it immensely. Again, it's, 
they don't live and die with their bad guys, but boy, when they got a good bad guy, it's just, again, it's just, it is, it really separates the men from the boys. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing how everybody handles Bale, you know, because he is a tiger by the tail. It, it, it's just going to be, I, I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be very nice. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think to me, Taika Waititi, I think, is a brilliant filmmaker who I think can throw curveballs at you mm -hmm. um, unexpectedly yes. and can find really dramatic and sentimental moments in the midst, uh, in the midst of his zany worlds. Um, and I feel like this looks like he's pushing himself into a visual place he's never been before. I'm not saying his films don't have stunning visuals, because they do. He has some great, fantastical elements to some of the stuff he does. But just that desaturated world that he creates for Gore yeah. looks great, looks interesting. It looks like Gore himself is a threat to existence for all beings. And, and that face in the trailer that Gore makes that's already a meme everywhere of like a smile, but that pain, right? Wow. Just instantly. It's like, I don't know what's happening, but I want to like the editor in me is like, Oh, I'm going to use that too. That looks great. I don't, the emotions on him are so complex and unique looking. So I, I can't wait to see what he does. And also, you know, I, I, I think there's something to be said about Hemsworth's ability to stand toe to toe with some of the greatest actors to ever exist. Absolutely. Whether it be, and I do look forward to that. Yeah. yeah whether it's Hopkins, whether it, it's, you know, Hiddleston, I think is a fantastic actor. Portman is a brilliant actor. Like, and so all of these that he's come, Jeff Goldblum that he's been on the screen with. He doesn't get the, he doesn't get a day off Hemsworth. It literally, it's like, who am I? Yeah. He, every day he's but, just got to be at his best. Absolutely, but he never he never looks outclassed. I don't he think always he and it's never and he never looks like he's pushing it. Like I always think about the actor's ego getting in the way, and I think about this one scene from Star Trek: The Original Series. I wish I could name the episode, but I have lost my virginity. Um, where there are three of them, the three great ones, are sitting at a table. And they're all lamenting over something. And Spock has this beautiful moment. And McCoy goes to comfort him, and it's beautiful. And then you can tell William Shatner doesn't want to be outdone. So he fucking unleashes into this tirade. And it's just like, that was unnecessary. It's how you feel when you're watching it. I think you're thinking of almost every original series ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but but you never see Hemsworth try to do that. He stays to the character. He stays to the story. And it, it just delivers every time. So I, I can't wait to see this. I'm super excited about it. I think it would be impossible for me to dislike this film, much like the next mission we're going to be discussing. Uh, mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Part 1, The Deathly Hallows, or whatever it's called, is the seventh entry in the long-running Mission Impossible series. That's what IMDb says as the uh, description, as the plot line. Even IMDb is like, there's been a lot of these. You know what they're about. Uh, directed by Christopher McQuarrie, starring Tom Cruise, Haley Atwell, Jesus Christ, Rebecca Ferguson, oh my gosh, Palm uh, Clementif, Vanessa Kirby, Indra Varma, Carrie Ewis, uh, Charles Parnell, Henry Cherney, Asai Morales, Simon Pegg, Shea Wiggum, Ving Rames, uh, Mark Gaddis, uh, Yunus Chung, Greg Tarzan Davis, his middle name is Tarzan, that's dope as fuck, Rob Delaney, and Anton Valenzi. Uh, this is obviously based on the television series uh, by Bruce Geller. Uh, Christopher McQuarrie wrote the script. Um, it looks like a Mission Impossible movie. Chad, what do you have to say? What did you think about this preview? You know, it's funny that you had said the description even says something like, you know, there's a lot of these movies, you know what it is, because this teaser does the same thing yeah it shows clips of prior mission impossible movies like yeah you know what you're gonna get this is the cool stuff from the other movies and now we're gonna show you cool shots in this one so you know we don't get any story but amazing shots tom cruise i've already talked about it don't know if i'll cry in this one though we'll see <laughs> i'll have to you know check it out as far as that goes but it's funny when uh we saw the trailer and vanessa uh, kirby showed up my daughter said, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, that's awesome. Shaw's sister is in this. And then she was like, oh, wait, that's a different franchise. <laughs> she thought like Shaw's sister was back in the Mission that's Impossible awesome. movies. Cool. Cool. Fast and the Furious. But yeah, you know, we didn't, get a, we didn't get any story in this. Some awesome shots. 
Tom Cruise probably doing half of his own stunts, jumping right. off cliffs and motorcycles, whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching it, no yep. doubt. Now, what about you, man, who in 2003 proved that he could play against type when he was cast as cute guy in Dawson's Creek? Um, Rob Prago, what did you think about the trailer for Mission Impossible? That's a pretty good story with that Dawson's Creek thing. You want to share it? Yeah, go for it. So I get cast as, uh, and this is the series finale of Dawson's Creek. Series finale. It is coming to an end in Wilmington. North you North ended North. the show. Got it. Ended the show. Um, Chad, you've heard this story before. There's no way you haven't. Um, but you may not remember because it's not that exciting anyway. Anyway, um, what's her name? Uh, so you're a cute guy. I'm supposed to do a scene with Michelle. What's her Williams. name? Williams. Williams. Yeah. Amazing. Oscar and Williams. I thought she was amazing back then, even though I really, really watched Dawson's Creek. So uh, book Dawson's Creek. Um, driving to uh, Wilmington. I get a call from Brenda, Paul, he people star. Uh, honey, um, yeah, look, they're having some weather issues. Um, they're going to push it a week or so. It's a turn around and come back. I'm like, oh, shit, okay, boom. So I was like, and then South Carolina, turn around, come home. And then uh, a week later, heading out again. And they're like, honey, ah, the weather, there's another storm off the coast. Um, can you just don't, yeah, they told you to go back again. So, okay, great. Boom, boom, boom. Four days later, ah, uh, honey, yeah, they, they push so long. They cut the scene. It doesn't. It doesn't, yeah, it's not going to happen. I'm so sorry they had to end the show. And literally, they ended it so late that I still got paid for the shoot. My name's in the credits, and I still get residuals. I never shot it. I never, I never even made it to set. Oh, so I'm literally giving you credit for something you didn't even do. Did not even do. I mean, I booked the job. But you but are I never not got a cute guy, clearly, oh. in, according to the film. Um, so I uh, have a nice postscript to that story, because I did watch Dawson's Creek. And there is a scene with Michelle Williams and a cute guy. So clearly, the agent was like, hey, Joey, they're not going to use you. Like, that's what's happened. Clearly, clearly. There's a cute guy with Michelle Williams in the scene. I'm just saying. Now, now I've got to go back and watch to see if it's a flash forward, because it was a flash forward scene where she meets a guy at the airport. And she's got a kid. God damn it, Chad. Now I'm going to go back years and, and just sulk because... He just looked at your headshot and they're like, he said he was cute, but he's yeah. not, clearly. Also, I want to say, I want to point this out. I want to have a postscript, postscript that uh, Brenda Polly is my agent. and does not sound like that, like either of the terrible impersonations they did. She's a lovely woman with the voice <laughs> of an angel. Please find me work. Um, so <laughs> That's awesome. Point is, what did you think about the Mission Impossible trailer? <laughs> um, I'm wait, sorry, wait. we're cutting you for time. <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs> Cruise has a great demo reel. It just looked like the greatest demo reel of action. Those stunt guys. It looked at, it was like, oh, awesome. And literally every people looked at it and they go, I can't wait to see that. That looks awesome. That looks like a blast. When's it come? And, and, and it says part one, I got even more excited because I forgot that they were shooting two movies back to back because Tom Cruise is getting a little older. So they're knocking out one and two at the same time. It looks awesome. Look at the, oh, by the way, I was going to say, one of the things that did save this third episode of of Obi-Wan uh, Kablomi is when Indira Parma showed up. Yeah. I mean, she is, I've loved, I think the first time I saw her was in the, the, uh, the first uh, series of, uh, um, what was the Idris Elba series where he's a police officer in uh, Luther. London? Luther. Played her, he played uh, his wife. She played his wife and she was great. And she's been great ever since that. So that was, that's nice. Look at these four women in, on this IMDb page. Haley Atwell, Rebecca Ferguson, Palm Clementif, Vanessa Kirby, Indira Varma. Five. That's five. That's five. Four. Um, that is just astounding. Absolutely. That's the thing that pisses me off about these Mission Impossible movies more than anything else. Is that every single time in between movies, he's fallen in love with somebody completely different. I can't get a single bitch to swipe right on me on Tinder in, in months, but this guy's falling in love and, and getting engaged every, in between every mission. I just, ugh. Um, look. This trailer, meh. It started, and I thought this was the worst trailer I'd ever seen because I thought it was fake. Because hyperbole, I, sorry, hyperbole break. Hyperbole. <laughs> I thought it was a fake trailer because there were shots in there, and I'm like, is that from The Mummy? Is that from Tom Cruise's The Mummy? Is this from Commando? Like, what the fuck is this? Because it seemed so 
disconjoined and there was no foley to it and it was it, it seemed like it was shitty quality all throughout the thing and don't get me wrong the spectacle was awesome but you could tell like a different camera was used for the close-ups than the other shots and i was just like it was fine maybe i'm just not connected to the mission impossible movies i don't think i've even seen them all and and I wonder if I have a problem with Tom Cruise. I don't think I. That's do. what I was about to say. I think it's Scientology. Yeah, you is that what be. it is, Keith? Did don't. you like? Were you a part of it and got out? I would be much more successful if I was a part of Scientology. <laughs> um, I yeah, I don't know. I I, I don't know. I, I like. Are, what are I, you the Leah Remini of this podcast? Is that who prob- you are? probably? I do. I I get sassy, and I I mean what I say. Um, I like. I like. Rob made me watch. Like to, Rob literally came to my house one day and he's like, I want to watch, I want you to watch the first 10 minutes of this movie. And then he stayed for two hours and 35 minutes of Mission Impossible 17 or whatever the fuck it was. And then left like with 10 minutes left of the movie. Ate all my food, saw there was no food left, and then left. And I had to, and I was like, I don't, what? Um, and then like all these things were coming up from the previous movies and I was lost and I was confused. Uh, whatever. I'll watch it eventually. I'll watch Top Gun eventually, but I'm just not. I was going to say, I did hear a couple of rumors. But it's funny you said that, that they were saying that that trailer was not supposed to be released, that there was, that somehow we yeah, got, got leaked, some stuff got got leaked, leaked, and then they were just like, fuck it, let's pretty it up as much as we can and roll it out, that it wasn't, that it wasn't actually a polished trailer. So you no, might no. be, you might be onto something there. Uh, but according to Rob, though, that does not affect him at all, because trailers can be as shitty as possible. No matter what. It does not matter. No wait, faces on people. Wait, does a 10-year-old like this? Count me out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't oh. know. I think it's uh I, I think it's awful. Oh, uh, it's a crime that you don't like Obi-Wan Kenobi. But speaking of crimes, let's talk about our next trailer. Um, this movie I'm going to go see Sunday. It just came out, but the trailer was just released not very long ago either um directed by Cro- uh, david cronenberg and written by david cronenberg the canadian master of cinema himself it's called crimes of the future humans adapt to a synthetic environment with new transformations and mutations with his partner caprice Saul Tenzer, celebrity performance artist publicly showcases the metamorphosis of his organs and avant-garde performances now this film stars leia Sedu, also from the bond films uh kristen stewart vigo mortensen scott Speedman, uh, also a Felicity uh, alum, uh, Tanya Beatty, uh, Leahy Kanowski, Denise Capeza, Don McKellar, Nadia Litz, uh, Yorgos Perpasopoulos, uh, Wilkit Bunje, Effie Kansa, Jason Bitter, and Sozo Satoris. Um, now, there was a previous film by David Cronenberg called uh, Crimes of the Future. This is not connected to that film. But I don't fucking know. Uh, Chad, what did you think about the trailer for Crimes of the Future? So, you know, I'm a huge fan of horror. Big time. I love horror films. But, what I, but the thing that I really don't like in horror is body horror. I'm not a fan <laughs> of body horror. And I'm not a fan of David Cronenberg because of that. The body horror, yeah. That's what he is. He's the body horror guy. So this trailer, nope. I'm not watching this movie. When Krista Stewart is doing whatever she's doing to her eye, no thanks nothing about this movie said let's watch this not can i say let me interject real my first david cronenberg experience the first cronenberg movie i ever watched was uh naked lunch and naked lunch there's a scene where robocop who i recognize because i fucking love robocop is writing and his typewriter turns into a cockroach with a vagina on it and begs him to finger it and i like and i was like 12 and i'm like what the fuck is happening and that's the entire feeling i had during this trailer but that's me trying to inspect it let's hear what the man who played inspector alan goddard in the 2003 video short identity crisis uh has to say about it this officially goes down as the first trailer ever that I was not able to get all the way through. Trailer. About halfway through, I was like, <laughs> you know, get the fuck out of here. I, I, I just, I, I saw enough. I had no interest. I don't, <laughs> I don't remember exactly the moment. I was, I can't watch another second of this fucking just, just torture porn, body horror. I just, I was like, it's fucking done. I'm done. 
and I liked the cast. I was like, yeah, Vigo, yeah, Kristen Stewart, yeah, Leah, Leah, uh, uh, say, say, do what, what's her first name, Leah? I don't know, Leah, I, yeah, I, fuck it. No, I, I, if I can't get through two minutes and 30 seconds, which I didn't get through half of it, there's not a chance in hell I'm watching this thing. So, we've got Crimes of the Future and Obi Wan episode three, the two things Rob cannot get through. It has to turn it off. That being said, if there was a little more body horror in episode three, I'm happy. Really, it's all depends on how you use it. I just think Cronenberg is very interesting. He is definitely a person who likes to explore the concept of fetishism. If you watch his movie Crash, that's probably the most evident version of it. But even in like something like A History of Violence or Eastern Promises, which I feel are much more tame versions of Cronenberg, definitely much more accessible. Yeah, yeah, but he's still playing with like History of Violence is the only movie mainstream movie i can think of that has a 69 scene in it you know what i mean um and that's vigo and maria bella not that i know the time code by heart but still um but like the interest with body modification i think can be an interesting place for him to play and the interest of performance what does it mean to be an artist and always on celebrity i'm sure some of those elements are going to be in there because they've always been in his work i'm just concerned that I, I think a lot of directors, as they get older, lose that thing that made them so relevant, lose that thing that made them not insular. I, f- I feel that when you become insular, you become an angry old man who hates episode one through three of a show for 10 year olds. Um, but when you can still be outward, you can still create art from observing life. And I'm worried that Cronenberg might have turned his view inside. So I, I'm trying to see it. You know, I'll see it Sunday and. and talk about it on the next podcast but i'm here for it even though it looks gross as fuck yeah cool. uh, uh vigo's chest vagina looks sickening um but let's uh you know move on to a more magical uh story and uh that's the new film from uh acclaimed madman george miller uh three thousand years of longing a lonely scholar on a trip to istanbul discovers a jinn who offers her three wishes in exchange for his freedom written by george miller augusta gore and a.s byatt uh based upon the short story the jinn in the nightingale's eye um the film stars tilda swinton idris elba pia thunderbolt burke otzerk Anthony Mosiat, Alaya Brown, uh, yeah, Alaya Brown, Sage McConnell, Abel Bond, Agani Gekmez, Ayantu Usman, uh, Peter Bertoni, and Leanne Mackesy. Um, yeah, this movie looks like an acid trip if I've ever seen one, which I have. College was crazy. Chad, what did you think about the preview for 3,000 Years of Longing? You know, I haven't seen Everything Everywhere yet, but I did get some Everything Everywhere vibes yeah. from this with maybe even a little big fish oh, all totally. swirled in. But it, it was just it was just wild. Like yeah. George Miller, you said it, you know, I forgot what you called him, but he's a crazy man. It, it, clearly, yeah. you know, it's just crazy. So I'm on the fence about this one. I'm not sure how it's, I'm going to have to hear, like, I was on the fence about everything everywhere. Everybody's loving it. I'm going to watch that. Yeah. So I'm really going to have to see what other people, you know, say about this. Because I'm really on the fence. Because it looks it looks like it might be too wild. It might be too out there for me. Understood. Um, what about you? Um, the actor who played the character of a uh, well, creative name, Steve, from the 2003 short video, or the 2003 video, Vicious, uh, Mr. Robert Prago. How did you feel about the trailer? Um, you know, I, George Miller is an interesting. He's an interesting character. He's one of these directors. Um, like the Cohen brothers or, you know, who they have their own, they have a very certain, certain a way of storytelling, their own sense of style. And I don't always jibe with it. It doesn't always work for me. Not that they're not incredible filmmakers, not that there's not, the, the quality isn't amazing. It's just the storytelling doesn't always uh, work for me. Um, so I'm a little conflicted here. Cause again, I love, I love Idris Elba. I love Tilda Swinton. I, uh, this looks like a really fun story. I mean, it looks, it really does. It has a great look and feel and energy to it. So I was like, because it looks like, this is going to sound strange. It looks like the most fun George Miller movie to me, personally. And again, I went back over his, and I've got his, you know, his filmography pulled up and I just wasn't, I, I was the one person who didn't like Mad Max Fury Road. I didn't like it. I, I hated it. I wanted to walk out of the theater. I was bored shitless oh my on this. God. Let's get the hell out of here. Run, 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 run. 
let's go back. Run, run. It was just, uh, it was just noise to me. Um, Bay Pig in the City. I know it was great. I just had, I just, it didn't, it didn't hit with me. Lorenzo's Oil. I, again, I wanted to love it. It was just. I, I, it, in retrospect, to me, the most fun George Miller movie was The Witches of Eastwood, which is, go figure. Um, so I'm looking forward to watching this just because it looks like all the pieces are coming together into something I would enjoy. Um, and it does look like a lot of fun. Um, it's something about genie stories, man. Three wishes. I, I want to see his perspective and take on it. What, you know, there's always some type of, you know, lesson learned, blah, 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 blah. And Idris Elba and Tilda going toe to toe. Or working, I, it's, it could be kind of fun. Certainly, looks like something for the big screen too. So. Oh, absolutely, I agree with that one. That's the only thing you said that I agree with. Listen, <laughs> here's the thing. Let me read the, the feature film credits of George Miller. Real I've quick. got him right up here. Yeah, no, I, I, me too. That's why I'm going to read them. The point of uh, proof. Wait, guys, let me pull them up too. I got to pull them up. Everybody, yeah, everybody, 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 we have Mad Max, The Road Warrior, Twilight Zone, the movie, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, The Witches of Eastwick, Lorenzo's Oil, Babe Pig in the City, Happy Feet, Happy Feet 2, Mad Max Fury Road. That's that's the movies this guy has made. I'm not saying they're not of excellent quality. I just, the way he tells the story doesn't always... But look at the variety of yeah. those movies. Yeah. Like, Look, I want to like him. I'm not even... I don't, I hate even saying that taking a shot. It didn't work for me. I get he is to be bowed down to. You're the problem here. Definitely. Oh, well, yes. I trust me. I get in this scenario. I am. Yes, I am the fly in the ointment. I get it. I, I'm I just saying, I, I wish I didn't have this, this, this missing crow episode. I wish that I got George Miller. I was like, you got an extra. I, I think the thing is that <laughs> <laughs> it's the, me. the point to me is like, I feel George Miller maybe more than any other filmmaker, is a pure storyteller in the sense that even something like Mad Max Fury Road breaks down the hero's journey. And we're just doing that straightforward. They're back again. That's what the hero's journey is. Here it is in a movie form. And, and I think that's brilliant. But then he does something like a happy feat, which the sequel has a completely different story structure and is nuanced. And I just think he's so interesting in the way he decides to tell stories. And... And he is a fucking lunatic. And sometimes lunatics with a camera make some great stuff. So I'm here for it. Um, uh, yeah, I might regret that, but he hasn't proven me wrong. So I don't think I need to be careful what I wish for. And I'm sorry if this seemed like an antagonistic argument, uh, Mr. Robert Prago. Uh, but our next film and television series seems like a very antagonistic one. Um, and that is Man versus B. And I was going to say, when I watched that Pocotta trailer, as I as I as I filter through my, my Yiddish uh, family members, I started thinking, what a simple, what a, what a completely simple plot. What a man B man has house sitting B toe to toe. And all I kept thinking is George Miller would fuck this up. <laughs> Somehow George oh Miller would, would, he would complicate it with something. It, it just stay the fuck out of the way and try, try not to make it some kind of cool avant-garde thing. You got man, you got B go at it. And I, and I strangely went, I kind of like the simplicity of this trailer. Yeah. Oh my God. Let me talk about this trailer real quick. Uh, man versus be a man finds himself at war with the bee. Chad looked like he sat up. Chad literally was like, I'm, 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 you, Chad's literally like getting ready for, like, gonna punch you. Fight. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> a man finds himself at war with a bee while house sitting a luxurious mansion who will win and what irreparable, dam irreparable damage will be done in the process. Um, so it stars Rowan Atkinson's and all oh. 10 ep episodes. There's 10 episodes of this. Uh, Daniel Fearn, Aisha Kala, Chizzy Akadulo, uh, Jing Lucy, Tony McCarthy, Lee Byford. Oh, I gotta stop you for a second. Are you telling me this is a series? This is not a movie? This is a series, 10 episodes. <laughs> all right, I retract everything. I it. <laughs> no, nope, you gotta watch it. I thought this was some. 90 minute crazy Rowan Atkinson are committed to watching the 10 episodes man versus Jesus B. Christ. Um, Chad, what did you think about man versus B and how do you want to punch Prago for his? <laughs> yeah. So this is what happened on this one. You know, Rob texted me earlier today. He said, we're, we're, we're recording tonight, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> then he sent me a text later and he said, add menu and man versus B to the trailer list. And it wasn't a group text. It was just to me. And I have to treat Rob like I treat my kid sometimes. So I replied, I was like, did you tell Keith about this? Like, did you tell mom? You know what I mean? Yeah. 
or are you just like going to surprise Keith with these two trailers or whatever? <laughs> and he came back and said something like, oh, Keith is the one that told me about him. And I was like, yeah, because I was thinking like, what kind of hard on does Rob have for this man versus B trailer? But he never adds trailers. He hates He's like, we gotta, it. We got to talk about like, man versus B, Chad. Well, I've had a tough time watching Rowan Atkinson too sometimes. I know, look, he's a, he's a comical genius. I get it. I well, just, listen, enough you said, enough. You said that it was a simple story, and that's exactly what it is. And they are taking this simple story, and I knew this before the podcast because I actually do a little research, that this was a series. And I was like, this is a series? Are you kidding uh, me yeah. with this? Yeah. Unbelievable. Man versus B. Uh, no. I would, I would no. have applied it in a heartbeat. You're telling me I get Rowan Atkinson locked in a mansion for 10 episodes, destroying shit because a B's attacking him? Yeah, sign me the fuck up. For 78 but- minutes, maybe, with the credits being outtakes. I try. I tried to watch the Pentaveret with Mike Myers. I got about thirteen and a half minutes That's in. That's very different. But I wanted to kill myself. Um, I'll, I'll what, go. I'll watch Rowan Atkinson in a ring with a B just to see what happens. What kind of creative shit he gets. He's like the Jackie Chan of London comedy. Absolutely. But I think you comparing him to the Pentaveret is like comparing apples and orange cider. Like it's not the same thing in any way. Well, am I, am I going, I know, knowing what Mike Myers is going to give me, I assume I know what Rowan Atkinson is going to give me, but I'm going to, I'm going to go, let's see. Cause I'm a big fan of bees. I'm kind of hoping the bee comes out victorious. The bee will. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, have you seen Rowan Atkinson here? film? Are you kidding me? Yeah. No. Why does he no. kill the bee? The bee could like, you know, pack up and leave. You know, like, fuck it. I mean, they'll, they'll be friends at the end or something. I mean, yeah. if it's 10 episodes, I mean, golly, we're going to have a huge arc. I mean, there's no <laughs> telling. Like, I'm sure they've already greenlit season two and three of this crap. Yeah. Are these episodes like seven minutes long? What the hell? I hope they're each. I hope they're Stranger Things season four. Two hours <laughs> per episode. Yeah. It goes darker than we've ever gone before. Yeah, backstory on the bee, and he was born, and his, his family. family. Yeah, where he's from. Yeah, one episode is just from the point of view of the bee, and oh, there's no dialogue. It's just with the bee. What was that That's episode of Breaking episode. Bad where it was just like about the fly? Yep, exactly. Oh, yeah. I've never bad. watched Breaking Bad. So. What the hell is wrong with you? I never watched Breaking Bad either. What the hell I is wrong about the with fly. you? Yeah, I don't know about the fly. Um, but yes, that's uh, Chad's opinion on that. And apparently the man who played Peter Walsh in 2003 is a conspiracy's opinion about that. He hey, is- Chad was in conspiracy. I was too. I was security guard. Oh, fuck yeah. Look at these famous look actors. His IMD page some love. Click on click on that. Give, some, give Chad some yeah, love. Me, listen, okay. there's no need. There were too many trailers in this episode for you to go down my list of IMDb credits. Pull up his IMDb number. Let's, 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 let's Let me see. see. I'm, I'm looking for him. Uh, I see a bunch. It's of- tough. No, um, I don't think say four million seven hundred thousand. Let's see how many Chad has. Chad Dowdy. He's got quite. So as a writer, he's got three credits. As an actor, he's got three credits. Additional crew, he's got one credit, and thanks, he's got two credits. Nice. So he's getting there, man. Okay. Um. So you got a lot of different choices here, just like a good menu, which takes us to our last trailer of the evening which is for the film, the menu rated R. A young couple travel to a remote island to eat an exclusive, uh, eat at an ex- exclusive restaurant where the chef has prepared a lavish menu with some shocking surprises. Directed by Mark Mylod, written by Seth Rice and Will Tracy. The film stars Anya Taylor-Joy slash my future wife who doesn't know it yet, Ray Fiennes, Janet McTeer, Nicholas Holt, Amy Carrero, John Leguizamo, Judith Light, Hong Chow, uh, Paul Adelstein, Christina Brucato, Arturo Castro, Reed Bernie, Rob Yang, Adam Alladerx, Peter Gross, Mel Fair, Mark St. Cyr, and Rebecca Kuhn. Um, this movie looks like it should be an A24 film, yeah, I feel. Uh, but I don't think it is. Chad, what did you think about the trailer for The Menu? I felt that it was a Shyamalan film. Oh, yeah. That, I that too. Ooh, Especially, yeah, you know, Leguizamo was in The Happening. Anya Taylor Joy's in his movies too. You know, you got some of his people or whatever in it, uh, but it definitely felt shaman esque to me. It was it was weird and intriguing. Yeah. And I looked it up too to see. I was like, I wonder how they like classify this movie. And IMDb has it as a comedy slash horror. 
or not slash comedy horror. Mm -hmm. So I'm just just curious. This definitely piqued my interest for sure. Me too. Me too. Now let's see um, what the man who played the reporter in 2004's Bobby Jones, Stroke of Genius, can report about his uh, feelings about this trailer. What did you think, Mr. Robert Prago? It 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 looked like a lot of fun. I'm becoming every time I see Nicholas Holt on screen, I become a bigger and bigger fan. I've always loved Ray Fiennes. Anya Taylor Joy is might be my favorite actor. Yeah, literally, same. just across the board. What she does is unpredictable. She is ever present. She is, uh, she is just intimidating. I just, I love the fact. I look at this and I go, "Fuck yeah, she could be the adversary for all this crazy cult, whatever this is." And I go, and and I put my money on her. I go, she's a badass. She, uh, this is. I look forward to. I look forward to her going toe to toe with these lunatics. Um, I, I I loved her reactions to what was going on. I. It's yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. It's it looks well shot. Absolutely. Um, who did I see? I thought I saw somebody at one of the producers was somebody well known. Who's the um I, shit? I didn't write that down. Uh, um, I can look up the producers of it. Producers real fast. Um, I thought it was somebody huge. I think, like, to me, uh, look, I, Nicholas Holt is like one of the nicest fucking dudes in the world. So I'm here for that all day. Uh, I'll watch any movie he does. When it says comedy horror, you know, there were some funny lines, I guess, in the trailer, but I wonder if it's going to be comedy more in the vein of like the stuff or something like that. Um, the producers, Adam McKay is a producer on the film. Adam McKay, that's what that's what it was. Okay. And Betsy Cock and, and Cody Katie Goodson, who does all of the uh, you know, uh, Adam McKay's films. So I, I wonder if it's going to be more in the vein of something like the stuff, which is a, more of a satirical sort of comedy. Or if, it, if it's going to go in that don't look up sort of area uh, of comedy. Either way, I'm here for it. I think Anya Taylor-Joy is just in this meteoric stage of her career where she's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And right now, I think she's a cult classic queen where she plays in the A24 films. You know, she plays in all of those. Um, and I think she has broken off, but it's it's been with directors who everybody respects within the filmmaking community, whether it be in Edgar Wright's Last Night in Soho or, you know, she's making interesting choices. So I, I think it's a great cast. I think Ray Fiennes is a bad guy this time with a nose. That's cool. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited to see what comes out of it. Uh, I'm, I'll serve whatever the menu or I'll have whatever the menu is serving. That would have been smooth if I hadn't fucked it up. Um, let's okay. go ahead and... Uh, uh, before we get out of here, there are two uh, sad passings that we need to discuss real quick. Um, one is in the entertainment world and one is not. First one, obviously, the passing of the great Ray Liotta, um, one of the greatest actors, not only of his generation, but ever. Um, I don't think anyone doesn't recognize that man's face um, and his voice has become synonymous with an entire genre of film. Uh, and sadly, he passed away. Uh, I know he was in his 60s, but that still seems way too young uh, for a man of his caliber of talent. And then the second uh, passing that I, I think we would be remiss if we didn't mention are, um, is the tragedy that took place in Texas uh, of the elementary school um, and all of those who lost their lives. A tragically too common of an occurrence um, and I know, you know, we often don't like to get political on this podcast, save the beginning of this show. Um, but, uh, you know, something can be done better and we just have to figure out a way. No child should have to go to school worried about if they're going to make it home or not. So, uh, a tragic, tragic occurrence. Um, so our thoughts are with everyone's families and with them and all that. Um, so before we, uh, leave... Chad, Rob, anything else you guys got to say? Just on the, just stay away from the politics on the Ray Liotta thing. I think, I don't, we just did not get enough work from him. You, you know, there was a period of time where it felt like he sort of, I don't know if he fell out of favor, if it was by choice. He just went away for a while and just didn't do a lot and then seemed to have a resurgence over the past yeah. decade or so. And it was, I, I, I always enjoyed watching his work. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's a shame, and it's well, yeah, too young, way too young. Yeah. What about you, Chad? Yeah, as far as uh, Ray Liotta goes, you know, after he passed away, you know, I, I went and looked at his IMDb, 
and I was like, surprisingly, I hadn't seen like a lot of his stuff. Yeah. You know, obviously, like you said, he is a genre. You know what I mean? Like, and you know it, you know, Ray Liotta. I was like, I've only seen like a few of the things that he was in. And so, yeah. So it's kind of like what you were saying, Rob, where he, you know, he kind of disappeared or if it could be by choice or whatever, but yeah, it was, yeah, it's, it's weird with him specifically because of that. Yeah. Um, but, but just to change the subject, I did have a question. I, I didn't want to talk about this trailer because I know that Rob is too old for it. And I'm wondering if you're too young for it, Keith. But uh, Beavis and Butthead is coming out with a Paramount Plus movie. I didn't see they released a trailer. Yes, it was like Beavis and Butthead do the universe, I think, or something like that. Yeah, I have not seen that. Yeah, so I didn't bring it up. I didn't like send in a text because I was like, "Well, Rob's definitely too old. Keith may be too young." But so my question to you, Keith, is: Did you watch Beavis and Butthead, or are you too young? all the fucking time? All the fucking time. Did you catch Butthead in um, uh, Chip and Dale? Yes. That yep. running for Congress? That's, that's the best little yeah, Rob. Butthead's in that, so I know you want to see it, and we're not lying. Yeah. I, I, remember, was not, I was not. A, it was sort of Beavis and Butthead sort of slipped through the cracks of time period for me. They would give uh, it. Obviously, it, it, obviously, it was, you, you know, heavy in the zeitgeist, but I was aware of it, but uh, I did never really watch it. Never, never really saw I it. I loved Beavis and Butthead. I remember in its early form, it was just interim videos in between music videos was what it was, and then oh. it developed into a full show king of the hill is a spinoff of that because he was the man who's i think tool shed they would jack off in and You're whacking in my trailer boys yeah quick whacking it boys um <laughs> and and all that and then i remember do america because that fucking white those white zombie tracks on that movie were amazing and just that sort of yeah I, i'm excited i didn't know there was a trailer we're covering the trailer next time definitely um that's all um so yeah so chad where can the people out there find you you can find me on Twitter, Chad129X, and the podcast on NQC Podcasts. Awesome, awesome. And then uh, for the man who played Odesky in the 2004 film Last Goodbye, credited as Rob Progo, Rob Progo, where can the people find you? I don't remember what the hell that was. Um, where can they find me? I'll be hanging out at Alta Bellies tomorrow evening um, okay. if you want to pop over. Um, I'm not sure what my Twitter handle is. I think it's at Rob Progo. Send me a Twitter thing. Tweet at That's me. what it's called. At yeah. Me. Send him a Twitter, guys. Everybody send Rob at, a Twitter. At me. At me, bro. At me if you dare. Um, and uh, I'm on Facebook at uh, at Facebook, Rob Prago. No, I mean, he's literally on Facebook right now, guys. He hasn't sitting been on, on I'm sitting on your Facebook. Are you disgusting? That's gross. That's gross. Thank All right. Well, as Stop always, uh, my name's Keith. Sit on my Facebook. That's disgusting. My name's Keith Brooks. If you want to find me, please don't. Um, and thanks for listening. We'll, we'll tune in next time, guys. Bye. Bye. Peace. Not Quite Cool is a podcast recorded in Atlanta, Georgia, in conjunction with Actors Teaching Actors and Bean Dip Productions. Thanks. Thanks.